Ladies and gentlemen, it finally happened. Primary Arms managed to get me one of their brand new PLX 1 to 8 First Focal Plane Compact LPVOs. A huge thank you to Primary Arms CEO Marshall for wanting me to get one of these in for review. Whether I like it and I praise it or I hate it and I thrash it, he still wanted me to give it a good honest review on it. So, ladies and gentlemen, you have Mr. Marshall, the CEO of Primary Arms, to thank for that. So, Marshall, thank you very much. Without further ado, let's take a look at this box. This is, in fact, my first time ever getting my hands on a PLX Primary Arms, and I have to say I'm extremely excited. Their first generation, or rather their older generation, PLX 1 to 8 First Focal Plane, was very reminiscent as far as feature set, weight, size, everything, to the Trijicon AccuPower 1 to 8 First Focal Plane I reviewed many months ago. And I had to say, I love the Trijicon version, and I can only imagine that the primary arms version was at least as good, but with much different reticle options and turret configurations. Right off the bat, these are made in Japan, which is something I'm very happy to see for the price. The price on these things, they come in roughly at 1500 bucks. I'm sure they'll go on sale for a little bit less than that, but for right now, expect to pay $1,500 for these. As far as the one that we have currently, this is the mill version, which is set up for 556-308. All of the information you're going to need to know is right here. You can pause this at any time. And uh, I can't wait anymore. I got I, I to gotta just rip this box open. I'm not going to rip it open. That's just a metaphor. But I'm going to slide off the main cover. Put that out of the way. <clears throat> someplace where I won't step on it. And I can really finally start to pay attention to what we have here. This is a very nice looking and feeling box. Everything feels nice and tight inside, which I would expect for the price. Now, how do I open this thing? Okay. Front flap. There we go. That's a very thick foam pad. Before I even look at the optic, we are going to flip through this reticle overview booklet first. Now, why did I opt for the mill? Only because I'm more conditioned to mills at this point in my life. I studied MOA and used them for a long time before I started reviewing. And once I made the switch to mills, uh, I, I can't go back. It's it's really a, a smarter, simpler, and easier to understand system once you get your, your foot in the door. Nice booklet. <laughs> go over that all you want. Big old cleaning cloth. The actual scope manual. There's a lot of different cool features that this thing is already set up for from the factory, which I really like, because guess what? Options are really nice. Just like the GLX 1-6 to first focal plane that Kyle had sent in, you can see that we already have two different style turrets. You can run this capped or exposed if you'd like. Again, how many other manufacturers are really offering something like that? Not many. Whew, okay. This appears to be one of the extra turrets. This is full mils, 10 mils per rotation. Perfect. Go leave that in there for right now. This looks like a sunshade, which is exactly what that is. We have a battery, CR2032 standard, two size Allen keys, and a couple of extra set screws. I don't think there's anything else inside of here. Clearly, there's nothing. But look at how well they milled out this foam to fit this optic. Tension to detail so far in this thing is exquisite. Bikini cap on this thing is very nice. Fits on here very tight. Nice, thin, and lightweight. And speaking about lightweight, holy hell. Lightweight is an understatement, folks. 17 ounces for a 1 to 8 first focal plane is quite remarkable. How remarkable? Well, if I take a Trijicon AccuPoint 1 to 4 like I have here and show off its quite svelte 15.2 ounces, including bikini caps, it put that into perspective, because the AccuPoint is known for being very lightweight, and this is very lightweight, but this is only a second focal plane 1 to 4. This thing's a first focal plane 1 to 8. That's just nutty. And nutty it feels. This thing isn't just lightweight, it feels like it's really sturdy and built like a tank. But let's find out for ourselves, shall we? Starting at the back, we do have a fast focus eyepiece, which is extremely tight to turn, or at least it was just to get it going. This thing is factory fresh. Get it all the way out. Quarter turn in. Holy cow. That is rock, rock solid. 
There is zero wiggle. There is zero noise. You could hear my wrist cracking as well as the seal gently riding on the outside of this. The knurling on this is proper knurling and it feels fantastic. I know I'm going to be getting ahead of myself, but I'm also very happy to finally see some sort of cohesion between this thing because knurled, 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 knurled. They're all knurled surfaces and they all feel fantastic. Granted, the knurling on the Fast Focus eyepiece, as you can see, is very fine. As we move up to the magnification ring, the knurling does get a little bit more coarse, but there's nothing wrong with that. 1x at 12 o'clock, 8x at just about 6 o'clock, so 180 degrees of throw, which is completely standard. The knurling on this thing is excellent. You have a great purchase on this thing. You do not have to worry about this thing sliding, even if your hands are a little sweaty or covered in oils or in my case, hand lotion, because my hands are getting just destroyed from the humidity. But again, you could see you grip on there very, very easily. You don't even need a throw lever to turn this thing. You don't even need to pinch this thing that hard. Your, your fingers just grip. It's almost like grip tape on a skateboard. But it, guess what? It includes a really beautifully sized throw lever. This is held on by two screws right there. So you can remove this if you want. If this thing breaks off, you could always replace it. But listen... Absolute silence, like it's rolling on ball bearings. Very reminiscent of a Razer HD Gen 2, if not even a little bit better. And I'm not just saying that, because with this texture right here, you don't even need a throw lever, but it's got a throw lever. The Razer HDs do not come with either. Onto the illumination control. You can clearly see we have 10 settings with offs in between. And that is pretty nice good amount of resistance to turn it and the detent is there but again very similar with the glx 2x prism i really wish it had a little bit more of a pop to it and it stayed there fortunately though there, this thing requires enough resistance that you probably won't have to worry about this thing bu getting bumped out of unless you really break it in the knurling on this thing is super aggressive, the exact same that we find on the magnification ring. And turning this thing, again, even with paraffin wax on your hands, is very easy to grip. And I don't have to worry about losing control of this thing whatsoever. I'm pretty sure this is sacrilege using a vortex tool on a primary arms optic. But removing the battery compartment on this thing is super easy, as you can see, because you have this really large knurled illumination control dial that you can grab just like so get in there and really twist it off i love how this is recessed you see that i mean granted it's unscrewed most of the way but this is basically flush in there so you don't have to worry about this compartment ever coming loose on you unless you want it to inside we find a standard cr2032 battery with six fingers holding it in place on the bottom side you do see that we have two spring-loaded prongs to put positive pressure on this battery at all times. We have a good size o-ring on the back part of the cap and a nice size spring on the inside putting constant pressure on that battery at all times. From there we're going to take a look at our elevation and windage controls. The caps on these things again are beautifully knurled. You have tons of purchase on this. Underneath there you can clearly see we have 10 mils per rotation just like we saw on the other turret which would replace this one. I do wish that the lines over here would line up a little bit better. It's easy enough to see right now, but I do wish there was more of a connect between the two so you knew exactly where you were going. Happily, however, as you might have already guessed, these turrets sound and feel fantastic. On the windage, you have your zero mark, and you have your right and your left with arrows. And of course, the turrets are also labeled 0.51R, 0.51L. You can't screw this up. Mm -hmm. 
before I forget to mention it again, there are two big old fat O-rings at the bottom of the erector, so this way you do not have to worry about any sort of water egress on this thing whatsoever. Now, because many of you are probably going to ask, well, how do you just change the turrets on these things? Even though I did it on the GLX first focal plane 1 to 6. Well, very easy. You have three little set screws that clearly get loosened up like so. Line this up at zero. I'm going to snug up this set screw ever so slightly. Let's see if these turrets have improved or not. Nope, they've improved. There is very little backlash on the erector housing. You can see it pops right into place. You twist it ever so slightly. You take out that slop and it just clicks into the next tooth flawlessly. They sound absolutely fantastic. And look, yet again, we have the exact same knurling across everything, with the exception of the eyepiece. The eyepiece is a little bit finer, like I said earlier. But holy cow. This thing is impressive. As good as this might feel, as good as this might look from an exterior standpoint, the real question is, how is it going to perform when we actually look through it and use it? So, without further ado, let's find out. Let's start off in the garage and fight our way out to the beautiful sunlight. Just like with the Sig Tango 6T first focal plane 1 to 6, if the illumination is too bright in an environment like this, it does reflect back on itself quite badly. Pew pew! As you can clearly see, however, once you tone it down a little bit to a more reasonable brightness given our environment, pew! Pew! It gets much better, which is nice. It's also nice to see that the illumination gets actually too bright in this sort of environment. It just means that when we're outside during the daylight later, you'll actually see it a lot better than you will most other first focal plane LPVOs. In fact, here, it's too bright. Pew pew! A quick twist of the illumination knob and it shuts right off. Pew! Again with that illumination knob, the knurling is stupendous. I do wish the detents were a little bit deeper. You could hear it just sort of roll out and into the next one, but that's about the only extent of my complaints with it. Pew! In fact, just to harp on it one last time, all the controls, all the physical controls on this thing are just about perfect. There aren't many things pew that I'd really complain about. I love the fact that at least all the neuron is coherent and it feels like it's a well thought out package from start to finish. Basically primary arms, large grand vision came to fruition. There's already a lot you can tell about this thing and how it's going to perform as a whole. We don't see a lot of the scope body, which is always a plus, and the image pew pew definitely seems to be on the flatter side of things. Talking real quick about the reticle, this is the ACSS Griffin Mill M8 reticle. It is clearly in mills, it is clearly in first focal plane, and it is clearly illuminated. The big takeaway from this is it's almost like Primary Arms was listening to my old review on the SLX 1 to 6 and 1 to 8, because I really liked how simple that ACSS reticle was. However, it was just a little bit too simple, just being a floating sort of dot in the middle of the overall image. With this, they very smartly added some big old duplex lines that tapered down ever so much to the middle, so when you zoom in, it doesn't take up too much of the image. The overall usability of this is going to be entirely up to you and your uses with the optic on your gun. Honestly, it's not going to be as simple as a point-and-shoot BDC that you find on so many other LPVOs or any other optics. This is trying to fill that void of having a really fast, easy-to-use BDC or having a much more tactical approach and being able to dial in for your elevation, very similar to the AccuPower 1-8. to And that will be brought up more throughout this entire video. As you've already seen, the illumination on this thing does get fairly bright, though not full daytime bright. When it's at its maximum, it will bleed out a little bit, but besides that, it's pretty sharp and clear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
These turrets are very nice, way nicer than they need to be on LPVL, but if you plan on using it exposed like this to dial, they're perfect. The illumination is very well done on this though, as far as just how sharp and clear it is to the reticle, as you can see right there. And you can see so far it looks like the reticle lines up extremely well to the target. Without further ado, all right, five mils over and up, and we are looking perfect. Return back to zero on the windage perfectly, and let's just keep going. One, two, three, four, five. And pretty close at the bottom. Looks like we're about a click off, maybe a click and a half. Honestly, for an LPVO like this, I'm gonna give that a pass. Resets to zero perfectly. These turrets sound, feel, and function flawlessly. One thing I cannot stress enough to you folks is that this optic is already generally flawed. What I mean by that is this. It's a one to eight first focal plane in a 30 millimeter tube that has the word compact in its name. That means that primary arm chose to have this thing be small and lightweight, more so than have perfect optical clarity, maybe even perfect illumination, perfect build quality. They focused on it being small and light. So there's gotta be some shortcomings with it. However, as you've already seen, it would be pretty hard to kind of figure out where that shortcoming would be. I mean, look at the image that we have here going across the power lines. At 1x, there's very little distortion. There's also very little shift. Those power lines only move the slightest amount towards the very end. Anything inside, I'd say the three-quarter view of the image is, as near as makes no difference, flat and sharp and basically perfect. But let's see how well the image sort of holds up when we start taking our magnification upwards. First off, the illumination at full is definitely daytime visible. It's a few clicks away from being full daytime bright, but honestly, given the size of this reticle and the way that the crosshairs work, I don't care if this thing's not full daytime bright. It really mattered, again, with its smaller brother, the SLX 1 to 6 or 1 to 8, because with that, it was just the center reticle and you couldn't really pick it up all that well in the best of conditions, let alone in the worst of conditions or in low light with really shitty illumination that the thing had. At 30 yards, the image isn't that great, but that's to be expected on some higher powered fixed parallax optics. This, of course, being one of them. But focusing our attention at this 400 yard brick building, slowly taking the magnification up, the image looks absolutely stellar to about 6x. Cresting over 6x and bring it all the way to its maximum at 8x, you can see the image definitely gets a lot softer in the corners. Now, that isn't too uncommon with a lot of stretched glass. What I mean by that is this is a 1 to 8 working really hard in a small lightweight body. So yeah, there's going to be some shortcomings that I definitely didn't mention more than 30 seconds ago. Pulling the magnification back to 6x, and I would argue tooth and nail that it is a perfect looking image. There's no chromatic aberration of any sorts that we can see, no fringing, color tears, no softening to the edge. It is perfect. I would absolutely put it up against the size 6 and the loophole mark 6. However, bringing it back up to 8x, you might wonder, well, what happens if you adjust the diopter a little bit? Could it get better? Well, as you'll see, going this direction, no, making it negative it's, makes it definitely worse. But going a little bit to the right, a little clockwise, a little positive, you can see that, hey, we can get the image to be much sharper. And actually, it looks significantly better than it did earlier. And you'd be absolutely right. I can get this thing, and you can get this thing, everyone can get this thing to look this good at 8x. But when I pull back the magnification all the way, you will see the reticle does soften up a little bit. Yes, the eyepiece is designed specifically to adjust the sharpness of the reticle to your eye, or in this case, my camera. I set all of these indoors on a very white sheet, like I do with my reticle overview, and make sure that they're perfect. With this, it being 100% perfect to the reticle means that it's a little bit off on the image. Now, you can find usually a healthy balance with this. 
Is it enough of a difference for you to have a slightly blurry reticle at 1x as opposed to a perfectly sharp image at 8x? I would probably hazard a guess and say probably not. So for the rest of this video, I'm going to have it in between two different settings to see if you will even notice the difference. It's a very minor difference if you're not looking for it. However, it does and will make a difference. That difference though is exaggerated on camera as opposed to the naked eye. In my testing and use of this thing over the last couple of months, I have found it to be a non-issue. So guess what? Everything I just showed you is just something that's going to be very specific to my setup. So bringing back up the topic of this thing being flawed, it should also mean that because it's small and lightweight and designed to be that way, that it's not going to let in a lot of light in darker environments. Well, as you just saw, focusing on the still slightly bright sky early part of the fall, it didn't seem to really have that sort of effect, but still letting a lot of light in. Let's focus now on our 400 yard brick building in suboptimal lighting conditions. But first, let's take the illumination up to its maximum. Here, it looks, again, simply superb. I crank it down to like around four or so, and it's just a little bit too bright for what I would still need it for. However, paying attention to our image at 8x, it does get a little bit darker, but as near as makes no difference, it's not really that much of a difference. If you're looking to take a shot or focus in on a target at distance, pull the magnification out a little bit and you won't have any issues. This thing manages to capture a lot of light. Let's fast forward now about two months. It's now early November. It is cold, it is wet, and I've had this thing for a long time. The reason why I've had it for a long time is because I really wanted to get to know it. I wanted to have a personal connection with this thing. And the more I pick it up and use it and play with it and show it off, the more impressive it became. Focus, will you, on the berm in the back and the concrete wall on the left. Unlike this thing's little bastard half-brother, the GLX 1-6, there is almost no shift in either of them. We still have a very minor soft edge to this thing at the very extremes, but as you'll see, that's going to be dependent on how well you can get behind it. Despite how good this thing is in every other regard, the eye box, as you'll soon see, is probably its weakest link, and that's just, again, because this thing has got a compact in its name. Illumination here in suboptimal light is more than sufficient, more than bright enough. And just, I can't get over how flat the image is at 1x. They really managed to do an amazing job of keeping this thing as good and as tight as it is for being as small and as light as it is. It's a very hard balancing act. And the one area where it does trip up that we're going to talk about soon is going to really be dependent on, one, how good of a shooter you are, Two, how good you have it, of your cheek weld setup you have. And three, just how much time you have behind it. Really? Even here at 50 yards, however, we have a more than usable looking image. I'm not going to say you're going to shoot 50 yard F class on rim fires with it, but if you had to take a very precise shot, it just goes to reinforce that you can use this thing efficiently at its maximum magnification from 50 yards to as far as you can possibly take your cartridge. Earlier, we were looking at 800 yards in that power tower, and if you just had to lay down suppressive fire, I absolutely reckon that you'd have no problem whatsoever hitting what you have to hit. Let me express to you the nitty gritty now of this thing's major flaw. I guess it could still be considered a design flaw because again, they designed it to be a compact. There's going to be a shortcoming somewhere. Anyway, it's not the 1X performance, believe it or not. The 1X on this thing is very good, more than acceptable, borderline excellent. You will see that the image in the background does move around, but not as much as I was expecting, considering that this is a first focal plane LPVL. We do have the reticle shut off in the shadows, but that's on any first focal plane optic. Here at 4X, it starts to get more in line with what I was trying to refer to. It does get tight, and it gets very narrow. So you could be perfectly behind this thing forward and back, but you can shift ever so slightly side to side, and you're gonna be losing the image. As a result of this, when I was setting this thing up in front of my camera, you're always supposed to do this, well, you're supposed to do this for anything, even your eye, but you're supposed to set your eye relief based on the 
optics maximum magnification. So when I did it on 8x here, I noticed that the rest of the magnifications sort of seemed a little bit tight. Like here at 6x, it is very tight. It's going to require an absolute perfect cheek weld and head placement every single time. So 6x and above, like here, 8x, finally, if you're not in a very stable, comfortable position that you are very familiar with, it's going to be a very hard time looking through it. And that is this thing's shortfall. It's just the exit pupil is so narrow. And that's, again, because it's a compact. It's just the design of the glass. It's limitations. That, however, is this thing's only real limitation. And it's only above 5 or 6x where you're really going to notice it. 1 to 4 is basically flawless. And let's just continue showing that, shall we? Its first main competitor is going to be the little brother, the SLX 1 to 6. If you're looking for an entry level first focal plane LPVO 1 to 6 that's going to perform better than it ought to, it is the SLX 1 to 6 seen here. It, no joke, has at least the optical clarity of the PLX C from 1 to 6. And it's got an eye box that's more reminiscent of a second focal plane LPVO, meaning that it's fairly big, open, and forgiving. The only big letdowns for the SLX are its overall general feel. It feels like it's going to fall apart, like it's a toy. And the illumination is abysmal, as well as the fact that the reticle just sort of floats in thin air. And at 1x, it is hard to pick up. Other than that, though, it is a supremely nice optic that I've recommended to a bunch of people that want to get into first focal plane LPVOs. If they're not willing to spend the $1,500 on a PLXC, they don't even know if the system is going to work for them. I recommend the SLX because it's fairly inexpensive. You could find them on sale. You could find them used. And they're going to give you an excellent idea of how the very best first focal plane LPVOs are going to perform. Next up is the only other 1 to 8 first focal plane LPVO I've got my hands on, and that is going to be, of course, the Trijicon AccuPower 1 to 8. Now, despite the fact that these are both first focal plane 1 to 8 LPVOs, they couldn't be much farther from one another. They're actually quite dissimilar. What I mean by that is the AccuPower slash Credo 1 to 8 is set up much more for a DMR specific optic. It only has exposed locking turrets as opposed to the PLXC, which you could do exposed turrets or cap turrets. The reticle is much more reminiscent for a more precision setup on the Trijicon. But it's also got a 34 millimeter tube and weighs about 10 ounces heavier. So, yeah, despite the fact they're both 1 to 8s and they're both, both first focal plane LPVOs, their main overall functionality is going to be quite dissimilar. Also, just take a look at the image size compared to both of these. These are both cropped 100% the exact same, and the image through the PLXC is vastly larger than it is with the Trijicon. The Trijicon has a much narrower depth of field, and you're going to lose a lot of situational awareness with it, and that's kind of important in most environments. Despite that, though, the Credo or the AccuPower can still be found for cheaper than this PLXC, and maybe you want something a little bit heavier to mitigate a recoil. Again, this is not an apple to apple comparison. Even this comparison is not apples to apples because the size 6 and the PLXC both have a lot of different features about them. However, the size 6 and the PLXC are both roughly the same weight. So if weight is on your mind, these two are going to be right around where you should be looking, in my opinion. These are both around the same price, if not the side being a little bit less expensive. The reticles are both completely unique to one another. The size 6 is going to have a BDC reticle. This one's set for 5.56. You can get it for 308. Whereas the PLXC, you're going to have this M8 Griffin reticle. Neither of them are bad in their own right. They're just set up differently. And you might want one, one, eh. you might want one versus the other. That didn't sound right at all. If you're really comparing these two for yourself and which one's better, the PLX has a little bit brighter illumination. I kind of like the reticle a little bit more on the size 6. I like the overall image quality and eye box size of the size 6 a little bit more than the PLXC. It's a little bit more forgiving and easier to get behind. However, the size 6, just like a lot of the products that ATI produce, are only coming with a 5-year warranty. And that might be a deal breaker for you. For me, it definitely doesn't have me sleep easy at night. 
primary arms will basically replace this thing. Basically, no questions asked. Last, but certainly not least, is the Leupold Mark VI. The only reason why I'm including it with this is, guess what? You might find one of these for around the same used price as you can find the PLXC new, give or take a couple hundred dollars either which way. And honestly, you might be tempted to go the Leupold way, and no one would blame you. Despite the fact it has a 34mm tube, it still manages to be basically the exact same weight as the PLXC. It is only a 1-6 to as opposed to a 1-8, to but it still has probably the best overall image quality of any LPVO we've ever looked at. And as far as having a daytime bright illuminated reticle, it is absolutely 100% daytime bright illuminated. It's on par with the Gen 3 Razer 1-10 to as far as brightness goes. However, as far as optical clarity goes, it absolutely defecates all over the Gen 3 in every single way, shape, and form. However, it's got one major flaw, and that is the exit pupil is very, very tight, especially with the illumination. If you're off axis even a little bit, it's going to just completely shut the illumination off. So if that's a deal breaker for you, definitely look elsewhere. But the loophole is very well built and has some of the nicest overall functioning turrets, being both mill and drop like a CDS that I've ever seen. And it's definitely something that you should consider as long as illumination is not a factor. So yes, I do have a lot to say about this PLXC. I've had it for many months, and I'm sure the guys over at Primary Arms are going, what the hell is taking him so long? I think part of that is definitely because I wanted to have a very intimate relationship with this optic because I really was just blown away by it the first time I got it. But partly, I also don't want to send it back. I really enjoy this thing. For its price point of around $1,500, if you're in the market for this exact optic, it's a no-brainer. The price point on this thing is very good. It has very good attributes. Granted, it does have some negatives, but guess what? Everything has a negative. It just so happens that the two negatives that this optic has is inherent to its design. It being a C or a compact model means that, like I said earlier, there were design limitations that forced the engineers and the developers to come up with something that was going to work around technically a problem because by limiting your space you're res you're restricting how much room you have to work with you got to become really creative with coming up with new solutions to get around that and speaking from experience dealing with a lot of mechanical engineers throughout my long career as a precision machinist i can say that I know that they must have had their work cut out for them because it's not easy trying to figure that out, especially when you're dealing with something as organic as glass. Let's start with the cons on this thing because there are only really two. And both of them, like I said, are just so happen to be coincidental with its overall design. That would be the eye box being tight above 5x or so. It has a very narrow exit pupil. And then just the image not being 100% sharp when the reticle is 100% sharp, in this case to the camera. Like I had mentioned earlier, to the naked eye, it's a much finer difference, meaning that it's not as easy to notice when you're really behind it. My camera setup is very rigid in every regard, so thus it really puts an emphasis on any sort of small imperfections on any optic which is great in a sense, because it only helps to really showcase it. Another very important thing to remember is, this is only a serving size of one. I only ever got one optic to look through, and odds are I probably won't look through another one of these in person for a very long time. So you might get one that's better, or you might get one that's worse. The nice thing is, Primary Arms with their lifetime warranty, I bet if you have a problem with yours, even if you don't like how the image looks, I bet they'd be willing to look at it for you to ensure that you're very happy with it. And you know what? That actually brings up another good point. Marshall and the guys over at Primary Arms wanted to send this in for me to review it. That means that they trust their product to be good enough for it to get a good review. Because if it's not good enough to get a good review, I would let you guys know. And perfect case in point, their GLX 1-6 to first focal plane was a real disappointing letdown. And that's just one little example. I tell it to you as honest as I can, because guess what? I'm just like you. I'm a consumer. I want to know exactly how something is, and I want you to know exactly what I think of it, and if I find any problems with it. 
Because if I say, oh, this is great, and it ends up it's being a piece of shit, then I look like a real asshole, don't I? But such is not the case here. Primary Arms believes in this product so much that I was going to give it a good review because of how good it is. Yeah. So if they're capable of standing by their product, then that's something I can absolutely endorse. It sets out and does what it was designed to do. Be a lightweight, compact, 1 to 8 first focal plane with great controls, really good glass that just works. And you know what? They absolutely hit the nail on the head with this one. To Marshall and the men and women of Primary Arms, keep up the good work. You guys are absolutely crushing it with your products lately. Between this, the SLX Micro 1X Prism, the GLX 2X, and a couple of the other things in between, it's really awesome to see that you guys bring out such innovative optics for the market at many different price points. It's only making the world a better place. And if I could pretty please, pretty, pretty, pretty please beg for an optic to be made from you guys, can you please make like a 1.5 to 10 or 2 to 12 PLX? That would just be amazing. So Marshall, thank you so much for letting me experience this. To all of my wonderful viewers out there, thank you so much for lasting the whole 36 plus minutes that this review was. I hope it was worth it because I put a lot of time into this thing. Anyway, thank you all very much for watching. As always, see you again next time. And a huge thank you to my Patreon providers and my Subscribestar subscribers. Without you, this truly wouldn't be possible. If you'd like to support my channel but don't want to join either of those, I completely understand. But you could still help by using my affiliate links in the description below, and or like, share, and subscribe as always. Again, thank you very much.